So good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to this last week of Research at Home. Um, from next week, we will probably uh, put up some of the videos from Research Ed uh, Loom, Durrington. Um, but it is the last week of our special Research Ed programming. Um, so today, uh, to kick off the week, we've got Christine Council with us. Uh, we are super excited, as you can imagine. Uh, Christine doesn't require much of an introduction, but just in case, uh, she is uh, an author, editor, blogger, uh, international consultant on uh, curriculum and teaching, uh, a history expert, uh, an ex-teacher trainer. I think uh, she's done, she's done it all. Um, and at the moment, she is obviously writing an awful lot about curriculum. So we are particularly excited to welcome her this morning. So without further ado, I will pass it on to Christine. Thank you very much indeed, Alain, and hello everybody and welcome. Um, I can't see you. I always find it very strange speaking into a void, but I'm reliably informed that you're there. So here is my theme for today, and I'm just going to hurtle through this and give you a flavour of it, and I hope stimulate you to further thought and discussion. Don't change the subject. I worded that obviously for clickbait purposes, um, but it has the double meaning that is intended. What support do our middle leaders need if their curricula are to flourish? So I'm going to do this by illustrating one issue that I've set out in my book, whoops, that I've set out in uh, my chapter in Claire Seeley's book, uh, The Research Ed Guide to the Curriculum, where I've explored this question of how we get a better conversation between senior and middle leaders. And that the focus of that book is largely secondary. The focus of the chapter, sorry, is largely secondary. Uh, but there are implications also for primary. But I'm going to focus on ideas and issues within that chapter and just drill down and illustrate them with reference to one subject. So the premise that's sitting underneath this is that we have a problem. We have quite a significant problem, is, which is that in focusing on curriculum, senior leaders have a really, really difficult job because the expertise of their subject leads outstrips them. They cannot be expected if they're a physics specialist to know how to talk music or if they're a history specialist to know how to talk maths. So my focus for this subject was how do you still get curricular coherence? Because a senior leader has a need and a right to understand the whole curriculum without bypassing the subject itself without bypassing an understanding of what the subject is trying to do. And in that chapter, I explore in much more detail what I'm not going to do now, which is that um, we have a problem in that typically in the past, senior leaders have coped with this problem by bypassing the subject and focusing on proxies, which is entirely understandable because how else do we read what's going on around us other than through proxies? So we have the proxy of results and the pro proxy of supposed progress towards results. We have the proxy of data. We have the proxy of approaches to te teaching and learning informed by cognitive psychology or whatever. And all these things can reveal certain things, but they can also conceal certain things. And this is what my focus is on today. How does the senior leader ensure that their conversation with the middle leader, with the subject expert, reveals rather than conceals? How do we make sure we don't bypass the thing itself? Now in the chapter, I go into great detail on this and set out a range of practical solutions, uh, principles to guide questions and some practical settings in which this can take place so curriculum conversations are better informed. What I'm going to do today in this very short talk is illustrate this with reference to one subject. So yes, I am going to give you all a history lesson. And I'm going to use it though to show some principles that surface for the non-specialist if that non-specialist senior leader is framed to ask the right kinds of questions. But hopefully we'll have some fun along the way and learn a lot of history. And through it, I'm going to celebrate five examples of real teacher practice, practice that you can look up, that your whole senior leadership team can go away and look up, or your, your history department can go and look up also, but it's the senior leaders I'm thinking of here mostly. So I'm just going to hint at it, I won't do full justice to it, just to give you a flavour of the richness of this practice. 
And in each case, what I'm going to try to uncover is the origins of the strengths of this practice. Where does the strength come from? Where is the coherence, the scope, the rigor? Where is it, um, where is it emerging from in that teacher's understandings, in that teacher's relationships with knowledge, in that teacher's connections with others through publication or through direct face-to-face -face contact? So five contrasting examples, although as you'll quickly see, they do all have a theme. So my first example is from a website which is called Another History is Possible. Here the teacher on this website chooses not to reveal his or her name, so I'm just going to treat it in the spirit that's intended, which is anonymously. This website is well worth a visit because you don't just get great practical resources and a way of teaching the transatlantic slave trade. What you also get is a story of how the sequence of lessons, or as history teachers call it, the inquiry emerged. You get a sense of where it comes from. Very succinctly, this teacher is able to convey the intellectual origins of where it came from, what he's reacting against, what he's reacting against in existing curricula. So you get his ethical commitments. These come through very strongly. And his ethical commitments or her ethical commitments are bound up with their intellectual commitments. And that's an interesting web to try to untangle. You can't really separate them in this case. And when you study this, you realize the, the pain of somebody who feels that up to this point, they were not teaching in a way that was optimal for the children or for doing justice to the subject. So what is this particular blog post about? It's quite extensive and it comes with lots and lots of resources. This particular blog post is about the teaching of slavery. The author comes up with a giant question, what we call an inquiry question in history. Was there more continuity than change in British Jamaican relations between 1760 and 1870. So here is an inquiry. He sets it out initially as something post 16, but shows how it can be adapted to any key stage really, or key stage two upwards. Was there more continuity than change in British Jamaican relations between 1760 and 1870? Just take that question in for a moment and think about why it might sound a bit different perhaps from a normal question that might frame a study of slavery. Where does it come from? Well, on the blog post, our author is very explicit and he or she tells us that a fellowship, a historical association fellowship weekend, a program of study uh, that this history teacher became part of was the setting in which this emerged. And this was something that was developed by the Historical Association and by two other organisations, Legacies of British Slave Ownership and Justice to History. These are all well-known organisations which history teachers go to, contribute to, serve. And he says on his website, the words I've put in pink at the bottom of this slide, it involved hours of work from all involved and hours more reading from us all. And when he says that, he's not complaining. It began as a response to an unforgettable 29 weekend, he says, an unforgettable weekend. So here was a CPD experience to die for, a CPD experience that was a game changer. But it was a CPD experience that put this teacher in touch with a range of, well, what? What did it put this teacher in touch with that changed this teacher's approach? Well, it put our teacher in touch with a range of scholarship, scholarship that perhaps isn't the scholarship that some history teachers typically look at. A lot of history teachers are now familiar with David Olusaga's work, Black and British, partly because of the, the TV series, but I would say many, many aren't. And certainly many history teachers are not familiar with the other two books on the left and the right. And in fact, if you look at the book on the right by Michel Rolle-Toyot, that book is actually about the very fact that many people are not aware of this. And Trio talks about formulas of erasure, how things in the past get erased. And this becomes a theme too of this particular teacher's curriculum planning and practice. So time to read these books, time to discuss them with other history teachers, and time to think through the implications of the stories that are surfacing and therefore how conventional mainstream content that pretty much all history teachers teach, slave trade, aspects of empire, 
might need to be reframed, might be better reframed. Or at the very least, certain questions that we might pose to the children so that they can understand the ways in which it might be reframed. But there's more to it than that. What else does this history teacher need to be able to do this well? Teaching any humanities or art subjects is personally costly because you are dealing with hot coals, you're dealing with fire. If you're standing there and you're dealing with something as horrific as the slave trade and you have to describe it, what are you to do? How do you describe it? Of course, you can go to the sources and the pictures, but the pain of actually describing it and the sense of ethical weight on you describing it is quite something. And strong history ITT programs spend a lot of time helping teachers think through ways of doing that, ways of doing it that are true to the historical record, ways of doing it that underline the weight of what is being said, ways of doing it that are not emotive, that are factual, but nonetheless are powerful. And then further thinking about what it means to give children power in the way they respond to it. And that's just the teacher and their relationship to the knowledge. How do they navigate that? How do they navigate that space if they feel personally affected by it? How do they share with the children the journey that they've been on too, of realizing that their own past perspectives and frameworks might have been faulty? And that's critical, isn't it? Because you have to be a historian, be an artist, be a musician in front of the children. So here is a space in which uh, professionals um, such as Robin Whitburn and Abdul Mahmoud, who are experts in justice to history, support this particular program. And I'll, so far I've just talked about the teacher, but the teacher's responsibility is to the children in front of you. And those children might be from a range of ethnicities or cultures. They too have a relationship to this knowledge. How do you navigate that? How do you handle that? This is the kind of setting in which a teacher can explore it. Now, why that particular question, change and continuity in British Jamaican relations over that particular period of time? Well, here's a little bit from the blog, which reveals why this teacher decided to go in the direction of change and continuity. And I need to give you a bit of background here as non-historians, because it's quite unusual to go for change and continuity as your big organizing concept, your big disciplinary concept for this, very often the questions are about the causes of the abolition of slavery in 1833, the causes of the ending of slave trade in 1807. In other words, normally those two events are not problematized, they're just there, and they sound like great big changes. <gasps> ending the slave trade, <gasps> abolition of, the slave, of slavery, that's huge, isn't it? Big change. And then we zoom then into causes of those things. But to do that is to fail to stand back and actually problematize the change itself. So what is a history teacher doing when they're doing this? They're weighing up. Should I frame this as a change issue or should I frame it as a causation issue? Obviously they're balancing that against other change and causation inquiries elsewhere, but they must in this instance be primarily led by the scholarship itself. What does it lend itself to? And in terms of things I'm perhaps rectifying in children's existing perspectives, what would be the optimal concept to use to frame this? And that's just three of the different bits of a sort of multi-dimensional matrix that the teacher takes into account. Let's just have a look at this little bit of reasoning here. The inquiry focuses on a question that organically emerged during that weekend discussing the legacies of transatlantic slavery with other teachers and historians. It's a question that the historical actors at the time both demanded answers to and then sought to change. It's a question that leaps up off the pages when reading the historical scholarship. Not least, it's a question that anti-colonial movements subsequently sought to answer conclusively. Indeed, as someone teaching within a post-colonial empire today, it's a question that still needs grappling with. And then he states the question that is sitting underneath his question about Jamaican-British relations. How much really changed with so-called abolition and so-called emancipation? So this is why it has become a change continuity inquiry. Instead of focusing on those two things, we're gonna situate it in a much, much bigger temporal picture. And that's gonna cause us to take in a broader time frame. Hence the 1760 to 1870. But we need to explain a bit more about why those dates. In making curricular decisions, 
those dates are, well, there are only some dates of many that you could choose. Really, you can implot history in almost any way. We could start in a number of places and it would make a different story. We could finish in a number of places and it would make a different story. You are always actually making stories. The past is there, it's not changing, but how you tell it, the moment you even put two facts together, you have made a story. You have put an interpretation on it. There's no avoiding that. And it's this that really conveys that sense of the ethical weight of responsibility that a history teacher has. Even in choosing these two facts and choosing to put them after each other, I am telling a story. I'm therefore giving a particular perspective. So this history teacher clearly wants them to see a particular story, but wants them to get in on it and problematize it as well. So this is why they chose those dates. Look at how this period is bookended. In 1760, before slavery is abolished, slave trade is abolished, we have Tacky's Revolt. Tacky's Revolt in Jamaica was a revolt that was initially successful. It was absolutely huge. It was very well organized. It was brutally suppressed. Then let's go to the period after slave trade has been abolished, when the black workers on the plantations are technically free. But then we get another rebellion, the Morant Bay Rebellion, brutally suppressed by Governor Eyre. Again, horrific stories, large numbers, hugely successful and then suppressed. So hang on, what's going on? If we look at the details of these two events, they are more striking for their similarity than for their differences, but the slaves were freed, weren't they, in between? So straight away we have a story, we bookend it with these two elements, and our history teacher can start to build, 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 and they're building what happens in between those stories, in terms of what the scholarship is telling them, and in terms of the question being posed. So, two major events in the middle that we would imagine the children know, but they look rather different now when they're bookended by that. And then if we start to flesh out all the other things that are going on, we see that not only is there an issue around implying that the story is over in 1833 when it clearly isn't, there's also an issue of ignoring the stuff that comes before 1807. So something that is often left out of teaching of slavery and teaching of empire is the 1794 Haitian Revolution. And it's often forgotten that this was the first emancipation of slaves because the Haitian Revolution, throwing off their masters, was the first successful slave rebellion and it led to freedom for these slaves. So again, we've got this, if we don't factor that in, what's going on elsewhere, we create a false impression, if you like, of what's going on. The picture is more complex and crucially here, we're talking about a story that shows that black people themselves had agency in this and they effected change. That so wasn't just something that came from above or came from Britain. Okay, my outline there is brief and somewhat crude and there's a great deal more to factor into this story. And nor is it a simply a case that we're just gonna replace one story with another. Far from it, the story is nuanced. Of course there was change after 1807 and 1833. Of course there's a range of agencies at work. But nonetheless, the story has become complex, more colourful, and we've done the thing that our big question must do in history. We've told the children that there is a problem to be solved. Does this curriculum planning start with listing concepts? No. Does it start with listing content? No. Where does it start? It starts in a number of places. So I think we need to be very careful when we think about what we're asking departments to do when we ask them to start planning. There are a range of starting points that make you decide that you're going to take the content in this particular direction and shape it. And in history, you've got that substantive content, which is an invidious set of choices from almost infinite content. And then you've got your disciplinary lens, which is what sorts of questions shall I ask? How shall I enable children to see the conditions under which valid claims can be made about this? How shall I get them to navigate the provisionality of any claim? So. In order to do that, this scholarship is consulted extensively and this furnishes further ideas for what we might put together. But in addition to why change and continuity, why British Jamaica relations? Because again, that feels slightly odd, doesn't it, as an expression, why British Jamaica relations? And again, on the blog, our teacher's very clear as to why that is. It needs, the topic needs broadening out somehow. 
The moment we say change and continuity, then actually we need to start thinking about, OK, so it's not just how much change. It's not just degree or extent of change. We've already problematized that. It's what kind of change. It's nature of change. It's also speed and rate of change. And this teacher, you can tell from this website, is really richly informed by those disciplinary concepts already and is using them, using them to frame these understandings. So typically abolition is about resistance, but what about economics? What about ideas of race? What about uh, notions of racialization? What about the way in which legal systems and language in, uh, strengthened racialization over time? How did certain ideas actually become more embedded as a result of these events, which might explain racist attitudes later? So the term relations allows students to learn about and discuss the totality of the system, its logic, its contradictions, changes and continuities over a hundred years. That's a very crude summary of the rationale that sits underneath this. I'm now going to switch to a completely different approach, which includes a study of the empire, includes a study of transatlantic slavery, but it tackles it in a very, very different way. Suzanne Powell, in this article in Teaching History in 2018, an article that's become something that is, is much debated and discussed by history teachers. She drew upon a very different tradition. She drew upon the tradition of big history, which has some origins in the States and some origins here. Uh, it also has been developed extensively in the Netherlands. And I just want to talk you through how she did this and what she was drawing on. And she ends up getting the students to do some very important work around slavery and the slave trade and empire and the origins of empire, but it's coming from somewhere else. Again, it's richly contextualized. And her interest here is getting children to understand global dynamics, getting away from seeing Britain as at the center of the thing. She's doing this with year eight. So in her inquiry, she used vast sweeps of time in the big history tradition to alter her students' historical perspectives. And what she's attending to throughout as she listens to what they say and the quality of what they write is about a million miles away from notions of poor performativity and objectives and standards as you could get. She's actually interested in the quality of their changing historical reasoning. And she's interested in the layers of knowledge. It's a very, very knowledge rich inquiry. The layers of knowledge that change what pupils see. Our previous example was also interested in that but this here is foregrounding it. So what does she do? She teaches her students really vast chunks of human history, vast stories of change, focusing particularly on migration, settlement, trade, and gradual political changes over time, city-states through to empires. And here's an example of some of the stories that the children read and talked about. This is really macro. And there are many pockets of experimentation in this kind of history in this country. It's not something that's massively caught on, but there are all kinds of pockets and history teachers talking to each other about how to do it. And there are many pockets of experimentation slightly different elsewhere. And history teachers in this country who are into this are in conversation with the work that's being done uh, by Dutch teachers where they focus too on frameworks. So here you see the kind of thing, around 100,000 around 100, years ago, humans began to migrate out of Africa. Around 10,000 years ago, humans had occupied almost all habitable areas of the earth and so on and so forth. And she gets them to understand what they should have done, hopefully, if they've followed uh, something which approximates to the national curriculum at key stage two, you can't always guarantee that, She's able to pick up on that knowledge, but constantly broaden it out. The little post-it notes that you can see around the edge are just examples of what her students wrote, because one of the activities she gave them was just to write comments, just um, unsolicited comments on whatever they liked about what they were thinking, what they were noticing as they read through. So Powell students process these stories by using various techniques. And what she did then was she zoomed into the smaller stories. They're not that small, but relative to this, they're small. And got them to think about how their understanding of those stories and their questioning of those stories changed in the light of this prior big knowledge. And she's very thorough about making sure they're secure in this knowledge. She's not just giving it to them and hoping they've taken it in. So. Here's just one little slice of her planning, stage two of her planning. And you can see in detail what she did. 
They studied six significant empires. Extremely bored, they held a debate. They're presented then with a series of ages. Notice all the time she's taking the language of historians of periodization and problematizing it. And they have to write a response on whether this is an accurate generalization based on their knowledge of world history so far. So she's using one scale all the time to affect another scale and moving between micro and macro or scale switching as we call it in history. But she found as she went forward she found as she went forward that there was a sort of ineluctable pull by the students back towards these British centred perspectives. So no matter how hard she tried, there was a tendency of the students then when they switched to causation inquiries, despite what they'd been taught to explain things in terms of purely British issues. So look at the three examples here. Why do you think Britain was able to build an empire from the 1500s, but not before? Several things to notice here. She's chosen to look at pre-colonial history and early colonial history, often missed out. There's a huge amount of conversation, which I don't have time to go into at the moment, among history teachers informally on social media and in their publications and their blogs about whether or not there's an enormous problem with sort of suddenly bumping into empire when you do um, the 18th and 19th centuries. But actually, when we're doing those good old fashioned topics, Tudors and Stuarts, when you're still focusing on national narratives, we need to be focusing upon empire because it's all connected. The Tudors and Stuarts were really part of a European a Europe that had been a bit of a backwater in terms of world trade up to this point. And what we need to be looking at is the relationship between what they're doing, wider trade and these early seeds of colonialism. So that's also coming in tears. So that's sort of entering left field if she wants to make sure they're secure in that content. But she now links that to these big scales and look what they come up with. Yeah, it's OK, but they're missing the global dimension. So she uses this to go back and refine and strengthen her practice, both the improvement of her curriculum and the way in which she intervenes to get these particular children understanding it. What does she draw upon to do this? Well, a huge amount. There's a quick summary that she puts in her article of the range of literature that she drew upon. And in her case, all this literature is already secure. It's what she knew about from her ITT course from her teacher training. So there's nothing here that she hadn't read on her initial teacher training course. She now goes on and reads some other stuff, but she's starting off in such a strong position because she's already got this knowledge. Some teachers have got that. I reckon most teachers haven't got it that extensively because history ITT is very variable. That's another issue that senior leaders need to be aware of. What exactly is the jumping off point of your head of department in terms of their knowledge of the stories of their own subject community thus far. So to the trained history eye, everything on that page is familiar. It's barely a name that you, you wouldn't know. Uh, to the, the non-specialist eye, certainly, but also to many history teachers' eyes, there are history teachers who wouldn't recognize some of this stuff. And of course, she knows that one, almost, one should always look internationally beyond these shores. And so she connects up what they're doing in Netherlands as well. Let's now look at my third example. And this example, again, sticking with the same theme, is about someone looking at slavery. But it's also about someone looking at big scales, big scales of time. But actually, it's quite different from Suzanne Powell's work because this is a study by Jim Carroll, and again, it's published in the Journal of Curriculum Studies this time. This is a study which looks at slavery over 30,000 years. So what Jim wanted to do is for, for, to get children to understand that slavery is very, very old, and therefore to find a way of framing the various manifestations of slavery, Roman, Greek, the transatlantic slave trade, and to think about how wider conditions affected slavery and changed it and how slavery in turn affected other things. But he doesn't frame his inquiry as change continuity, nor does he frame it as the causation question that Suzanne Powell came up with. He frames it as significance. So he draws on yet another tradition from the history education community, which is that of historical significance. And his question is tongue in cheek. He clearly doesn't think it should be forgotten. He's gonna say the opposite. But 
The reason he asked the question is because it is very often forgotten in curricula in this part of the world. Although honourable exceptions accepted, plenty of history teachers do try and teach it, but I don't think you see it as the norm in most key stage three history programmes. And anyway, the Haitian Revolution not only hasn't been forgotten in serious um, history writing and historiography, it hasn't been forgotten in so many places in the world. It's an absurd idea that we might even say it's been forgotten. It's preserved in popular culture, it's preserved in various forms of memorialization. So, for example, the famous Cuban novelist Carpentier based his second novel, The Kingdom of This World, on the Haitian Revolution, which had a huge impact on the Latin, Renaissance, Latin American Renaissance in fiction. So it's not been forgotten. And that's all part of what the children need to understand about what this means, what this event means in the experience and ideas of others. Jim needed to narrow his inquiry down and keep it focused. He taught his pupils the history of slavery on the planet over 30,000 years. And gradually, over time, he enabled the children to think about what was the significance of the Haitian Revolution in the context of the history of slavery. So we can ask what's the significance of the Haitian Revolution in, in many senses, but he's asking what is its significance in the history of slavery, or rather how does the history of slavery alter the way we look at the Haitian Revolution? So, should the Haitian Revolution be forgotten? How did Jim Carroll get there? How did he arrive at that inquiry? Well, let's think about what he drew upon. He certainly drew upon the history education literature, the same sort of literature that Suzanne Powell drew upon, and the practice of other history teachers in particular, teachers like Rick Rogers in Leeds, who's done a huge amount of work on big history. And he also drew upon articles uh, about the second order concepts, in this case, historical significance. There's a huge amount in there about how we get children to hunt for the criteria for significance. The reason I'm stressing this is that Jim Carroll is not reinventing round wheels. He's not wasting time reinventing round wheels or square wheels. An awful lot of history teachers do because they haven't got this. They haven't got this access. I would say there's a divide among our history teachers. Uh, it's more a continuum than a divide, but there are those who, particularly at the moment, prompted by the need to look more closely at some of their practice by the Black Lives Matter movement, who are arguing and exploring and challenging each other. And they're doing so at a very high level because they've got so many common reference points and they're challenging each other to feed in new reference points. And there are many other history teachers who feel they need to do something. And I think this particular time we're in um, is, is, a, is a good example of where if you haven't got intellectual resources to draw upon, then you're really quite stuck. And if you haven't got this, you're actually in quite a fix. What are you going to do? Bolt on a unit on colonialism? Is it going to be any good? Is it going to be tokenistic? Are you going to bolt on some black history because you feel you should? Again, experts in the field say the last thing you want to do is bolt it on. And it's no good either just sort of going off and reading one thing. These are deep moorings and one needs sustained engagement with them and there's no, no avoiding it. So whether you've got a history department that is doing this stuff and needs to be listened to and understood and probed or whether you've got a history department that doesn't know any of this stuff, and is wondering what to do and where to go without wasting time reinventing wheels, it needs to inform the kinds of questions that senior leaders ask. And there's another area that he had to draw upon too, the various histories of slavery across time. So he was pretty well equipped with that one when he kicked off, pretty well equipped with that one, although he had to do some research. Where was he going to do the extra bit, the extra bit he needed to look at? Well, he had space had memory space and space in his time to focus on the area that was his gap, which is the actual history of slavery over time. Okay, that's my third example. I'm now going to move to my fourth example, 
My fourth example is just going to change gear a bit. I focus there on colonialism and slavery, but we're going to focus now on teaching pre-colonial societies. In fact, even the term pre-colonial doesn't do justice because it sort of takes away from the agency of these societies. But in brief, many history teachers at the moment are discussing, many have always done this, some are doing it more now, some are being challenged to do it more, are discussing the importance of teaching societies and civilizations properly and not bumping into them the moment that empire reaches them. And this is quite a problem with an awful lot of Key Stage 3 history programmes. I see it all the time. So a typical Key Stage 3 history programme at the moment, I'm afraid, is often Normans, 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 couple of kings, Beckett, Henry, Magna Carta. Um, then we move into Tudors and Stuarts, and then there'll be a unit on empire, and then we might do Industrial Revolution, and then we might move into First World War, Second World War, Cold War. It is quite staggering that those kinds of curricula actually still exist. Because here, we've got to an example of something which other history teachers are doing, which is really very different, and more of them are doing now, and feeling, feeling challenged to do it now. And that is studying civilizations and societies properly and in their own right, and being very careful that we don't do it just because of the next bit to do with empire. An example of that is just doing Islamic civilizations for the four or five lessons before you do the Crusades. And so the reason for doing the, the Islamic civilizations is just to get to the Crusades. So even where you position it in the overall curriculum tells you something about what you are saying to the children about the importance of this content. So, um, Abdul Mahmoud and Robin Whitburn are very well known for their work in teaching teachers how to teach black history of all its kinds. They're very passionate about integrating it with British history. And they look at sort of things on two fronts. On the one hand, making sure that British history includes and integrates black history, that it is part of nation building. It is part of modern British identity. It's not something ghettoized. But secondly, they also do this other business of making sure that children study a range of societies and study them properly. And what they're doing here in the very brief example I'm going to give, which I've taken from their book, is they choose to give it a very different spin again from the examples I've given earlier. Their choice is to focus on interpretations of the past, which has a very particular meaning in school history education. The tradition that sort of developed among history teachers, which Mahmoud and Whitburn um, demonstrate brilliantly here, is that of studying real subsequent interpretations by others. So it's not about, you know, is this right, is this wrong, you know, is Mary bloody, uh, was Cromwell hero, was he villain, these sort of superficial moral questions. It's actually much more about how did these other constructions by others, including pernicious ones, ranging from the scholarly to the popular, how do they come about? How are they constructed? It's a very, at its best, strong tradition in history education. It's also easy to teach badly. And I find running around the country where head teachers ask me to look sometimes at their key stage three curricula, I still find some examples of some really, really poor interpretations teaching just for want of some knowledge and understanding of the range of ways in which this can be done. Anyway, I recommend Mahmoud and uh, Whitburn's example here because it's superb. They again have a provocative question, how dark was the story of Africa? And what they're getting at here is that in uh, a European and Western context, particularly with the advent of colonialism, the idea of Africa in the Western imagination was increasingly a negative one. And they explore very carefully how that is something that actually is a construction that emerges from colonialism, is not true earlier on. And so, for example, they, they get children to learn a great deal about the um, West African kingdom of Mali and the reign of Mansa Musa and this extraordinary mosque in Timbuktu. And Timbuktu is a very useful thing to uh, get children thinking about perspectives on the past, because Timbuk Timbuktu sort of through um, the language that emerged from empire, it began to become an expression which meant otherness, which meant the ends of the earth, uh, which meant you're know, going all the way to Timbuktu. It's somewhere alien, somewhere mysterious, somewhere dangerous. It's the word that represents distance. So Mahmoud and Whitburn thought very carefully about how do we handle the fact that our children in our classroom will also have some of those understandings and how do we get them understanding how those constructions came about and how they are being shifted and why. 
So it's really strong interpretations work, focusing on subsequentness and focusing on construction. It's not superficial. And of course, when we learn about Timbuktu, it is absolutely inspirational. It is a vast, vast university founded in the 14th century of enormous scholarly significance um, and, and a major center of Islamic learning that would feed into wider as Islamic learning that would connect up with the Renaissance this is an absolute center of gravity of scholarship. So the other things they looked at too um, were the ruins of Great Zimbabwe. And again, it's fascinating to track the way in which the ruins of the city of Great Zimbabwe are represented in subsequent interpretations. So in looking at the question of how dark was the story, by which they mean the stories that were told of Africa, they looked at, for example, these artifacts, a travel poster from 1938, which conveyed the impression that the great monument of Great Zimbabwe can possibly have been built by medieval black Africans. They looked at the images depicting a colonial Rhodesian view of the origins of Great Zimbabwe ruins and how this colonial view tended to attribute uh, the great ruins of the, the monuments in Great Zimbabwe to various non-black societies. They kept trying to little locate it in the Middle East as they weren't prepared to acknowledge its West African origins. Then they look at something a little bit later on from 58, a Mortimer Wheeler film clip. And there we see some changes in the interpretation. We see it being taken more seriously, but still the tone of the thing is very paternalistic, still very skeptical of African prowess. What are the children being asked to do here? What are they looking at? What would you want to know they were looking at if you were observing such a session, such a lesson? Well, what they're being asked is, what is the tone? What is the message? How is this constructed? What kinds of messages are actually coming through? What kind of impact would they have had on the audience? And then finally, they look at a 1998 interpretation by Henry Louis Gates commenting on the engineering feat of the Africans, where we finally see some reasoning from archeological evidence. And in this particular case, this interpretation, I'm fast forwarding here, they showed an awful lot of other stuff. This particular interpretation includes you know, a black filmmaker, um, a black crew members and a black archeologist. So the children see the black agency too in the construction of the interpretation. Putting it like that is overly crude. Again, Mahmoud and Whitburn are not simplifying the past. They're not just replacing one story with another. They convey complexity, but they're getting children to access the way in which these interpretations were constructed, and that is their story over time. Change and continuity is a theme, but interpretations is the framework. So there's an example. You can look at these different um, types of um, history teachers practice in these summaries in the edition of um, in, in various editions of teaching history. What's the wisdom on interpretations of the past? What's the wisdom on inquiry questions? Um, the journal teaching history does these occasional summaries. So those perhaps who are not so well trained or indeed trainees themselves can go to a summary of the sorts of things that history teachers have come up with. But in Mahmoud and Whitburn's case, they are drawing on so, so much more than this. They're drawing upon sources that go well beyond the community of history teachers in this country. And that brings me finally to my last example, a blog by the history teacher, Paula Worth, which is about West Africa again. And it's about Mansa Musa, the West African king and his pilgrimage to Mecca. And when he went on that pilgrimage to Mecca, the man who was possibly sometimes regarded as the richest man ever on the planet rel relative to those around him, he actually caused a mini depression in the Middle East because he took so much gold with him. And here are some extracts from Paula's blog to show you the journey that she went on. Notice the similarities and notices the differences from what I've just outlined. So there's a little extract from her opening page and notice what she draws on. Today, I show how my reading of Frank Capan's best-selling Silk Roads, my reflection on the seminal work of Bailey, Watson and Kennett. Bailey Watson runs the Reading PGC for history and uh, Rich Kennett is a history teacher in Bristol and the work of Catherine Flarty. She's a history teacher in Buckinghamshire and Toby Green, he's an academic historian who's written about West Africa, how these various people helped me to broaden my pupils' horizons of medieval history. So she quickly summarizes where she went to to make sense of this. 
And she drew particularly upon the work of Bailey Watson and Kennett, two very, very significant history teachers in all that they've written, um, and in Bailey Watson's case, a teacher trainer, who've developed a thing called Meanwhile Elsewhere. And meanwhile, elsewhere is pretty much what it says. It's a way of ensuring that children, when they encounter a particular um, development or change, perhaps in Britain or Europe, are always thinking about, okay, what's going on at the same time elsewhere in the world? And this has the effect of just creating a, a disposition to be always asking that. So it's a, a perspective changing method through the particular knowledge it draws. And it's very um, efficient because it allows you to sort of pack more content in, if you like, but in a sensible way and an efficient way, rather than just overloading the children. The comparative force of it just enables the children to assimilate the material. She also draws upon Toby Green's scholarship, Peter Frank Capan's scholarship, which she's read most recently. And now let's have a quick look at her reasoning. Because it was the summer holidays, I decided to tackle two curricular problems at once, scope and rigor. There's two words that Ofsted use a lot at the moment. The first problem was that our year seven curriculum was too Eurocentric. The second problem was that it needed to be reinvigorated by scholarship. And she quotes Frank Capan here, who explains that if a medieval merchant were to travel beyond the inhospitable and uninhabited de desert of North Africa, they would be somewhat amazed by the great riches of West Africa. The mineral wealth of this region was the stuff of legend a region known only to most early Muslim writers simply as the land of gold. This led to the development of flourishing cities such as Jenei, Jao and Timbuktu, which became home to royal palaces and splendid mosques. By the early 14th century, Timbuktu in particular was not just an important commercial center, but a hub for scholars, musicians, artists and students. And then she goes on, but I wanted to know more. Here was an opportunity to shine a light on other cultures and empires, way beyond the Williams and Edwards and Richards, Richards of England. Here was a chance to tackle historical myopia. And not only that, the study of medieval Mali could help correct a problem with perspective, as the historian Northrup notes. Historians need to move beyond externally generated and Eurocentric perspectives that treat sub-Saharan Africans in terms of their skin color, their prominence in modern slavery, and the legacy of guilt that slavery and discrimination have left in the modern world. So she gives a little bit more detail about the Malian Empire, talks about its trade, trading gold for the salt of the Sahara. She gives us a little bit more background in our bl her blog. Her blog is just a very practical guide for other teachers. She's generously sharing her practice. These merchants were those of the infamous Silk Roads. The medieval Silk Roads of the Middle East and Asia were, according to Frank Capan, the axis on which the globe spun. Now see what she's doing here. This is so much more than just saying, let's do some African civilizations to diversify our curriculum. It's about saying, if you start thinking about big global dynamics over time, and you start looking at trade over time, then you see different sorts of center of gravity, if you like. You see different sort of sites where all the action is. You start interpreting what's taking place in Britain in a totally different way. It enriches your understanding of British history hugely because you see the interactions, but it also alters your disposition to look elsewhere. And of course, the trade that's taking place in Asia, bringing in Africa, is like a, a spine, if you like, through the world. And Europe's involvement in that, uh, to, to a much greater extent, comes later. The vibrant Mali Empire of Western Africa was connected to these Silk Roads at a time when Western Europe was nothing but a regional backwater. And Africa was known to medieval England, if mostly in legend. As Olusoga co co comments in Black and British, both the people and their continent continued to reside within the realms of myth and legend and scripture. So, then she starts to think, how am I going to frame this? And she starts to think about this idea of lumping and splitting. One of the key issues that all who dare to do world history must struggle with is the question of human similarity and difference. Lumpers argue that all people are basically similar and can be understood using similar concepts and questions. Splitters see people in different times and places as basically incomparable. And then she says, this was a pivotal moment in my planning. So this later piece of scholarship has altered her lens for looking at the earlier scholarship. I had wanted to incorporate medieval Mali into our study of the Crusades, holding up Mansa Musa's journey as one of many different types of pilgrimage. 
And at first sight, this seemed sensible. This pilgrimage was exciting. It would be familiar to year seven. They already know about pilgrimages. And I could do some lovely alliteration and lump in Mali and Mansa Musa in Mecca. And so she was sorely tempted. She really wanted to ask the question, why did Mansa Musa go on a pilgrimage? But she resisted that temptation. This is this ethical and intellectual commitment that she has, holding herself to account. I'm not sure, she's saying, that it's satisfactory. Nice question, though it is. Lovely, though year seven will find it. What if my curricular lumping meant that I had shoehorned medieval Mali into a European paradigm of world history with its familiar pilgrims and kings? I was imposing a European frame of reference. I was going to be doing that to some extent, but here she's making sure that she's kind of pushing at the edges of it onto an African one at this point. Was Musa's idea of pilgrimage different from Henry II's? And was they actually diversifying the curriculum? And splitting didn't seem like a good idea either. So what does she do in the end? This matters because my intention was to diversify the Key Stage 3 history curriculum. And I decided that focusing on medieval Mali through the lens of Mansa Musa's pilgrimage might risk year seven, seeing the inquiry as just another pilgrimage. I therefore returned to the scholarship. And here, the focus appeared to be on why Mali was so successful. That's what historians are asking. That's the interesting question. That's what they want to know. So she thinks through her inquiry question. She draws on traditions around inquiry questions in the history education community in which she's well versed. And to cut a very long story short, she moves from why did Mansa Musa go on a pilgrimage to Mecca to where did Mali keep the secrets of her success? And here she's influ inf influenced hugely by Tim Marshall's book, Prisoners of Geography. Because in reading that book, she notes that, um, that the things that Marshall draws attention to around the challenges that Africa has, very few natural harbors, very few rivers that don't get interrupted with waterfalls, and the way in which Africa created problems for that kind of emergence of certain kinds of trade. And so instead, she uses Marshall to get herself thinking about, okay, so if there's a puzzle as to how this kingdom did become so wealthy, where do I need to go? Where do I need to look to try to explain that reality? So I hook year seven in with the story of Mansa Musa. He's too good to do away with entirely. She does the pilgrimage. She does the story about him causing a mini depression in the Middle East. She does all of that. But then I go geographic. I go Silk Roads. I try to change year seven's perspective of life, the universe and everything. And that last comment, and that's how she ends her blog, shows, I think, although it's tongue in cheek and she's self-deprecating throughout, it shows her ambition. And that really is what history does. It changes your view of life, the universe and everything. And other subjects do that too in their own distinctive ways. And this is the weight we go into teaching with, this sense that I'm not just teaching some content, I'm changing their views of, it's a huge responsibility of life, the universe and everything. And that isn't just me parking some content to replace another content. It is somehow finding the right structures, the right disciplinary framing to retain that openness so they can go on and challenge claims and reframe for themselves. So as we draw to a close, what do these five teachers have in common? I've mentioned the first one already. Secondly, they are in constant conversation with culture. I think this is true throughout the arts and humanities. They're just different from teaching science and maths. You cannot be a great art teacher or music teacher, surely, unless you are still an artist to some extent, unless you are still a musician. Pretty rare to find an art teacher or a music teacher who isn't still practicing their art. You'd be very most unusual art teacher or music teacher if you didn't love art, didn't love music. And likewise, the history teacher, the English teacher, these are lovers of literature. These are lovers of history and we be that person in front of the children. And that means we have to share our connections, our, what Michael Young calls our relationship to the knowledge that we teach. And that comes in so many different forms and I've tried to summarize them there for history in that middle bullet point. A constant conversation with culture. Historians works, the history education discourse, other history teachers, and endless wider debates about the communities that they serve. 
and they hold themselves to account against the discipline, the community of history teachers and other teachers. They, and this is perhaps might seem slightly threatening in some ways, but they see their major locus of authority as the discipline and the community. It's that that tells you that continuing conversation, checking out wider and wider circles of reference, whether they're doing a good job. So what kind of support do and nurture and challenge? Do teachers, all teachers, those being very successful and those who struggle need from senior leaders. They need reading to be valued, nurtured and rewarded. One of the seminars I frequently used to do with history teachers, I would ask them, you know, how often have you been praised for the amount of reading you have done in relation to the content you're teaching? What interest does SLT take in the kinds of discussions around reading that are taking place in the department? They need leaders to ask them hard questions, not easy questions, hard questions, which reveal rather than conceal the heart of their work and the significance of their work. And they need this curricular thinking to be sustained because curriculum is never done. This isn't something you get right. So what are the structures and systems and culture in the school that mean this conversation is always there, nurturing, nurturing to the history teacher's identity, their very way of being. I've elaborated on some examples, many more practical examples of how that can work in the chapter. So do look it up, another plug for Claire Seeley's book, which contains all sorts of chapters that are much better than mine. My chapter's at the end and it includes examples of principles for informing conversations with subject leaders. And I offer six principles there. And I also conclude with what I call three sites of transformation three sites of transformation. These are practical settings in which senior leaders can interrogate the subject. And my theme throughout is how do you interrogate a subject that is not yours in a way that reveals more than it conceals? And I set this up by, by showing the huge danger of proxies that can get in the way where we think we're gaining information from a subject, but all we've actually done is we have satisfied a management narrative. So requiring to use them same headings, for example, on work schemes, and I explain why that's a problem, same headings across subjects, or how we might imagine that data on its own can tell us how well children are doing. So how do we get over that and become more curriculum led is the theme of the chapter. And I'm gonna conclude now though with a bit at the very end, which is just the practical bit, uh, to say three sites of transformation where this can happen and just briefly touch on them. The first site of transformation is what do department meetings look like when they're curriculum led? What are departments discussing? What might SLT expect to see in a department and how might they value and nurture this? Are all department meetings about the subject? Are they natural CPD? And in the chapter, I give an example of English, which we won't go into now, of a particular program for Key Stage 3 English, an example that's fleshed out by a group of English teachers who I worked with, who built this as a model plan. And they looked at the patterns of sequencing, how one thing served another, how difficult things later were made possible by things that are earlier. And I have fleshed out in the chapter a crude summary of the discussions those English teachers had and framed it as a set of questions that a good head of department might use to frame a strong department meeting. This is miles away from a department meeting that is about admin and it's miles away from a department meeting that's about data. It's about actually focusing on the stuff that really changes the child and what the content is doing at any one particular time. The second thing I focus on is senior leader, um, senior middle leader management conversations. So here's a series of questions. They're generic questions which allow you to get at the substance of what is taught, its role, what it is doing to change the children subsequently. And I flesh out examples further in terms of subject specificity. But these questions, they're not meant to be a checklist. They are something to inform an ongoing conversation. And finally, translating the subject. This is a tool which um, I owe to Grace Healy, who's currently the curriculum director at the David Ross Education Trust. She first developed it for geography. 
where and she encourages every department in her role as a, a trust-wide curriculum director now to show SLT their subject, to reveal their subject by getting them to answer these questions and to keep probing and keep challenging if, what it, if, if anything in those boxes is not subject specific, is not pointing to the matter in hand. And notice the bottom right, what does SLT need to know? What is the department currently reading and discussing? And here in geography, we have an example of some geography, geography education scholarship and some real geography scholarship and some geography education scholarship that is thinking about the geography scholarship. So Bustin is a geography teacher. They're reading, writing by another geography teacher about geography and they're using that. That's their priority at the moment for shaping their thinking. SLT needs to know that and use it to drive their questioning. So. Is your interaction with middle subject leaders revealing the subject or is it concealing it? Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, really inspirational. And all the while I was, and we don't really have time for questions because uh, obviously <laughs> you feel the hour uh, so beautifully. Um, but for me, it just highlighted one thing is that really SLT ne needs to set the culture and a culture of reading and scholarship and yeah it would be nice to think that it happens in many many schools um and so we can just set that as as a kind of the aspirational uh standard if you like but certainly encouraging staff to read and and asking them what they're reading at the moment what the department uh, is discussing and reading is certainly something that's going to be a big big takeaway as well so thank you so much for your time and expertise this morning. Oh, hang on, just a little question. Oh, no, someone just saying it was a terrific presentation. So there you go. <laughs> um, I did have a few questions, but I don't think we have time now. Um, perhaps we could finish with a reminder that it's uh, probably a good idea to try and engage with subject um, associations. Although I was wondering all the way through how strong those associations are in, in different uh, subjects and certainly you're very lucky in history to have such a, a strong tradition of journals and conversations that are so ongoing. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, hopefully um, we'll be able to share uh, this presentation uh, with, with a wider audience. Um, if you have enjoyed it and if you think you've got questions, well perhaps you can keep those questions for uh, a timeline or or they're in the, I think many of the answers to the questions might also be in Claire's wonderful book. Yes, so that's where I focus on that, you know, that I've shown you a gold standard here. And of course, the reality on the ground is that most departments are not in this place. So what are the baby steps that senior leaders can take to try and move a department on that's in a very, very different place? I agree. I mean, the, the book itself, and I know I'm biased, obviously, but the, the book is, is just so, so strong. So a strong recommendation there. And as Kristen said, that that kind of final chapter is really, really useful to inform discussions um, with, you know, between uh, middle leaders and senior leaders. Um, so thank you very much, Christine. Have a wonderful day. And uh, everyone, we'll see you again at 11 tomorrow morning. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.